Now, with just under a month to go to the 2024 general elections, political parties continue to put their best foot forward and campaign across the country. This is true of Shiluba Political Party, which also plans to contest the 2024 national and provincial elections. Bahai Tudumelang, Kitabo Molokwan, welcome to this edition of Soweto Today. Tonight we'll take a look at uh, political party Shiluba, which was launched last year by the former Action SA Houteng Provincial Chairperson and former Executive Mayor of the Midvale Local Municipality for the Democratic Alliance, as Bongani Baloy, who's joining us in studio this evening. He is the founder now and the president of Shiluba. Uh, to come and talk more about uh, their plans as a party. Mr. Balu, much appreciated for coming and welcome to the show. Thank you so much and let me greet all the viewers at home in allowing us the opportunity to come into their comfortable spaces and share and have conversations which are very important that determine the course of the future of this country. Much appreciated. I mean, normally the first question would be uh, when, uh, you know, was the party? But uh, one thing that I know is that you've just recently celebrated a year since... Uh, you started the party as Shilova. Uh, maybe let's start the conversation there. Uh, how has it been? You know, uh, 12 months of existence and now we are heading to the elections. Obviously, you know, there was quite a lot of work that went into it. Absolutely. I mean, it's been a fulfilling journey. Uh, for us thus far, it's been a very fulfilling but difficult journey for obvious reasons because we had to start almost a year ago uh, and actually fashion a political party which is not like many others. So when you're saying we're going to fashion a political party, that's not like many others. It means there must be those differences that are very apparent to all of us so, so we can appreciate why there's a difference and why there isn't a convergence of similar like-minded political parties. So working the ground and building a constituency has afforded us to grow and to grow mainly in our townships and informal uh, settlements because our people are saying they're tired and they're despondent from the politics because it hasn't yielded any material uh, democratic gains for them. And that's why many people my age are saying, but yeah. you know, we keep electing uh, older political parties and leaders who actually don't uh, deliver the, go the, the goods to the communal table of the community. So that's why we exist. So we, we are a year older, we are w much wiser, we are much more robust, much more resilient as a party. And we've managed to, to actually build a political party without reliance on money, but relying purely on our efforts, on our energy, on our time that we have as young people. I mean, speaking about money, we know that, uh, you know, it is the name of the game uh, mm -hmm. in politics. But uh, these days you look at people throwing in, you know, uh, various amounts to different things. And mm -hmm. obviously it makes it difficult for smaller parties, uh, you know, to compete against the bigger ones because they've got maybe a bigger budget. Uh, and so, um, you know, in terms of going out there to the communities, um, what is it that people, uh, you know, uh, have been telling you as a party that they actually want to see yeah. happen? Look, I mean, people are quite uh, clear about their lack of trust for politicians also because of the source of funding that goes to those political parties. And those sources of funding uh, do not come to those political parties for nothing. Funding flows uh, to parties which, uh, cons which uh, those funders have a consistent agenda with those political parties, where they want to sustain the, the type of situation we have currently, which gives them more money or they benefit extremely out of that situation. So when we are on the ground, we make this point very clear to our, to our voters and, and, and members and parents on the ground that we're a party that has not accepted money from rich people or rich families because we know what our agenda is. Yeah. And our true agenda cannot be polluted by money because money can pollute any person, but we've insulated ourselves. On the ground, they tell us the following, that they are unsafe, that they are unemployed, that foreigners are competing for services, yeah. <clears throat> uh, both in the primary health care and also in public education, but also in human settlements with South Africans, and that uh, the state has not uh, yielded the democratic dividends that it should have, that they've mismanaged the economy and thus growing unemployment and thus growing all of those services from the social basket as a consequence of an economy which is not performing. So all of these things we attribute to three things in the main. We call it leadership, mm -hmm. we, leadership challenges in the country, we call it governance challenges in the country, and we call it uh, a mismanagement of the economy. The, the mismanagement of these three things gives us 
every socioeconomic situation that manifests in society that we see today, be it unemployment, poverty, be it crime, be it illegal immigration, all of those things can be tied back to these three things, leadership, governance, and lastly, but importantly, economy, mismanagement of the economy mm -hmm. though. I mean, your message has been centered around, you know, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu ideology, mm. uh, you know, which is, which is something that you don't see, uh, you know, when you listen to the different uh, campaigning methods of different parties. Mm. Maybe let's talk about that, you know, the essence of bringing it uh, to that, uh, you know, level here, yeah, Ubuntu. Correct. Um, how, you know, what is your message behind that? Look, we were clear that when we fashion this political party, we are doing it for people like me and you. So that's why we've been calling it Shiluba, which is a beautiful flower, in Berlin, like a cool. Where, where we firmly believe that it must, the name must follow an ideology which is African origin, by in, in, in origin. And we see lots of political parties, socialism, communism, all these different isms that are born out of uh, uh, constraints from a, a Western uh, situation where people decided to do something. Why can't we uh, lean on the, uh, on, the, on the knowledge, on the wealth of knowledge of our ancestors? Many people don't actually understand Ubuntu, by the way. Many people will tell you Ubuntu is defined by I am because we are, by Rolomo. And we're saying, but no, 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 that's, that's lazy. Yeah. We have taken it out, out according to ourselves to actually define Ubuntu and the various aspects of Ubuntu that must work together, that defines and defends our essence as, as black people. The problem, Karone, as black people is that we enter politics and assimilate into a culture of in the Western culture. When you assimilate Utloha from your essence as a person, you go into a culture of another person, adopt their value system. So then we become foreign creatures to ourselves. Yeah. You would find that black people are so schizophrenic. Go higher, I'm higher, I am something else. In the economy, I am something else. Because Africans all the times are forced to assimilate into a culture and we don't become ourselves. And the, the fact that we don't become ourselves is the main reason that we are losing our essence and we are losing Butubarona and, and we are therefore being populated by anything that's foreign. as Africans. So we are saying enough is enough. Let's go back to who we are. Let's transact with the politics, the rest of the world, from who we are as African people, protected and, uh, and by, by Ubuntu Beto. So we can take it there. So there's three aspects briefly about Ubuntu, which I must really touch on briefly. Yeah. One is Ubuntu Abantu, which defeats this ideology that you are an individual first. Huruna, you're part of a collective first. So being part of a collective, what makes you Ubuntu progression over a period of time is how you deliver on the, on the, on the, on the communal table. So the improvement and betterment of the community therefore makes you moon, not the other way around. That's why you'll find people putting their success ahead of the, of the group. That's why you'll find black people either selling black people to get ahead, yeah. they're selling the, the, the group. So that we must defeat it. Then the next two part, I won't touch on too quickly, but it's Isintu Namasigo. These are things that ground a black person, so that defines who we are and what other nations are. So we are leaving all of these things and becoming things that are just adopting anything from the world. So when you enter a space of economy and economy, you are not going to uh, grow in a way that protects who you are. Chinese are still Chinese. They don't, leave, they don't lose their traditions. Even the Nordic countries, they don't lose their traditions. Mm. It's only us who, who leave our traditions and become something else. Now that has a consequence for the type of policy, for the type of government. But most importantly, another facet of Ubuntu which many people don't talk about is meritocracy and rule of law. Meritocracy because how roaming one who's got no capacity to deliver. Yeah. When you ask someone to go perform a job, a job you, you select the best person. So part Part of an inbuilt aspect of Ubuntu is meritocracy. The best of the best must lead us in, in our system. But most importantly, the issue of uh, ensuring that the rule of law is tight. When it, when it comes to Ubuntu, we don't put aside, we don't say individual rights are more important than the rights of the group. So that's very important. That's why Ronald is saying that the, the, the collective, we must protect the collective. Because now when you start saying an individual's rights is more important than the rights of a community, we are going to lose it because we must protect the community. Uh, Mr. Bali, we're going to park it there for now. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, I want us to delve deeper. I mean, that's a very interesting way and in a very thorough way of putting Ubuntu there. Because normally, you know, you would see even government having, uh, you know, their messages on various departments saying that Ubuntu, but that actually doesn't translate to uh, what they are supposed to be as uh, you know in terms of services and and stuff but that's very interesting that we will uh, continue the conversation after the ad break let's take a quick breather we're coming back after this 
Welcome back. You're still watching Soweto Today. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. We are nearing the end of the show. I'm still in conversation with Bongani Baloy, the founder and president of Shilova Political Party. Um, Bongani, you know, I'm interested also in finding your plans now. We're heading to the elections. Correct. We've got uh, a month uh, mm -hmm. from now on. Uh, let's say three weeks because Correct. time is really, really, really gone. Uh, what's been happening on the ground with Shilova? Um, uh, have you been to uh, the various communities? I mean, I can see uh, you're visible also in Gauteng province. Uh, what has it been like, uh, you know, as we are heading to the elections? Look, it's been all system go. We are on the ground. Uh, we're in informal settlements and townships. Now we are scaling up our, our, our uh, and ramping up our campaigning. We we're launching our billboard today, yeah. centered on our key messages of what are we going to do? And what we say to that uh, question is that we're going to do the following. Number one, we're going to restructure government. By restructuring government means we must move away from the constitutional democracy to uh, parliament sovereignty. Number two, we must have a cabinet, I mean, cabinet by half, we must reduce cabinet by half, we must remove the provincial sphere of government. And those powers from the provincial sphere of government must go straight to local municipalities. We must reduce the number of local municipalities from 257 to 60 districts in the yeah. country. And they must perform those provincial functions as well. We must have one synchronized election. And for young people in the economy, we must urgently rescue by taking them to the military for two and a half years. And others take them to rehab before they get there. And those who've got the skills that are needed externally uh, across the, the world, South Africa as a country, we must assist them, we must group them and send them and have agreements with other parts of the world to take uh, our skills that are needed. And therefore create more uh, jobs on this side by doing the following. One, we increase uh, tax incentives for companies that are onboarding more young people. We, subs we increase our subsidization for labor absorptive industries and we ensure that we also support in uh, agriculture uh, and invest in agriculture. But most importantly, we can't do all of this if there's no strong law enforcement. Yeah. So law enforcement is going to be the hallmark of what we are trying to do, which is going to enable our governance. So it means that if we find that you have committed a crime and you are convicted, you will lose your right to vote during the time of serving your sentence. Mm. When you are released, you have your right back to vote. No person who has committed a crime against society must have the right to go and decide who must lead that society. So, do you, I mean, in the interest of time, mm. do you have plans to deal with the struggling SOEs? I mean, mm. uh, just in a few months ago, we heard on the, uh, the issue of you know, what has been happening at Richards Bay, you know, mm -hmm. in Devonport, uh, the issues that have been happening with the South African Airways, ESCOM, it's Correct. it's a mess left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you have plans to deal with those with, mm -hmm. with, with those things? And also, um, you know, the, the predictions of IMF mm -hmm. is that we are looking good as the economy, even though, you know, I mean, our growth rate is around 0.8%. Which is not what we want as a country. Um, how do you? What is it that we need to do in order to get yeah. to that level? To unlock growth and get to above three percent growth in the short term, it means we must deal seriously with logistics and economic infrastructure yeah. and SOEs. So logistics is what caused the country almost 300 million because you had uh, about 100 uh, boats that could not dock uh, because of uh, challenges in Richards Bay. We must remove those challenges. We must uh, increase investment and defeat cartels. What the story they're not telling you about the challenges in Richards Bay is, is cartels, which then affect your ability to get something in or out of the country because you are not linked to so-and-so and, and certain companies are given it. So we must break up those, com those cartels to allow for ease mobility of goods and services and logistics. We must reinvest a lot in ESCOM and other SOEs because the moment we lose those SOEs, we lose our ability to be able to facilitate yeah. a, an environment that increases growth. So these SOEs naturally are not meant to be profitable SOEs, by the way. Break even is the best you can do because the bigger role an SOE plays is actually in the facilitation of economic growth and economic transactions within, within our country. So we've got a serious plan and the part of our plan is actually to, to not allow a lot of private investors in this because their intention now is that it's by design that we see the SOEs in the position they are so they can be sold to private sector. There's a there's a view that private sector is the best thing in this country, which is wrong. I mean, look at the corruption. People, do, when they speak yeah. corruption, they just speak in public sector, public. not the pub private sector. In fact, we'll lose control of it. And as a state, we must never lose control of key sectors that facilitate economic uh, uh, participation, collaboration, but also inter in interaction and transaction in the country. As we wrap up the conversation now, you know, um, what would be the message 
to Sowetans out there, to people from Alex, to people from Malamulele, uh, you know, uh, from Siandani, every single place uh, in this country. What would be the message from Shilova as we are heading to the elections? The time to vote for Nelson Mandela is finished. The time to vote for Mdanaga Pindangene is finished. It's now time to vote for our future and the future of our children. When you do so, you must make sure that you're voting for the most competent leaders who have longevity, who are ethical, who've got a public record. Because all of what we are doing as Africans is to say, let's start where we should have started in 1994. Let's change the system. Let's empower parliament, which will naturally will be a parliament uh, full with company, with, with, with part, political parties that have an interest of black people one way or another. And we firmly believe that if we can consolidate the power into parliament and therefore make it easier for us to transfer the economy and various sectors of the economy, we'll be able to deliver a tangible uh, material difference to our people. And to do that, you must vote Shiloba. So when you get on your ballot, you'll have three ballot papers. You'll have three ballot papers. Vote Shiloba on the first one, vote Shiloba on the next one, and your last one, vote Shiloba. So look for the party starting with an X, and look for this handsome gentleman on your ballot paper, Fagum Krell. Make an X next to him and consolidate your future. Well, Ganevalo, much appreciated for coming in. Very interesting indeed. We will definitely be following your campaign trail, and uh, hopefully we will have you uh, as soon as the elections uh, wrapped up. Much appreciated for coming in. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. That was uh, Shiluva Political Party founder and president Bongani Baloi, who has been with us uh, tonight to let us know what the party stands for and what uh, some of the plans are as we are gearing up to the national and provincial elections, touching on various issues there from uh, SOEs to corruption uh, to how they plan on reducing cabinet, uh, you know, uh, once they are elected uh, to governance. They're much appreciated to Shilova Party for coming in this evening. That's how we wrap up today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you, so please feel free to talk to us. Simply send us an email at Soweto Today at Soweto TV dot or you can call or WhatsApp us at 081 8857. From myself and the rest of the team, it's good night and thank you for watching. Welcome back. You're still watching So Way Today. Much appreciated for joining us. My name is Tabo Malukwani. Before the ad break, we started the conversation on the Shiluba Party, which recently celebrated its one year anniversary and plans uh, to contest the national and provincial elections for the first time this year. My guest tonight is uh, founder and president Bongani Baloi uh, as we speak about the party's plans. Mr. Baloi, much appreciated for staying on. I mean, you have joined the cause of calling for. Uh, you know, the constitution to be, um, uh, you know, replaced by parliamentary supremacy. Maybe let's talk about that. Uh, you know, um, how do you think that should happen and also uh, the impact that it will make? Look, I, I think the one of the mistakes our the founding fathers, those who negotiated our democracy in 1992, made a mistake of, of insisting on a constitutional democracy, which 30 years later, we can evaluate its full benefit. And we can make the statement conclusively that the uh, democratic dividends have been marginal for black people. Yes, infrastructure has improved, water, sanitation, and various other things have yeah. improved for us uh, compared to apartheid. But apartheid is not the benchmark for us. We are much better. Apartheid was a crime against humanity. Now we live in a democratic South Africa. And what? do black people take home every day? Let's ask that question. And you'll find actually that there's minimal majority now taking home 350 a month, uh, which is a grant from government to subsidize their suffering, uh, from their suffering. So, so we firmly believe the consequence is the system. Many people don't want to touch the system. Yeah. The system gives birth to this reality. Whether you would have competent leadership, whether you would remove issues of corruption, I don't think that like, the lives of black people from an economic point of view would have changed. In fact, white people are making more money now than they are in apartheid. So effectively then, this system is not for us. The government cannot transform because there's various actors who will contest the government. Many people say we live in a constitutional democracy today, but I go a step further. Yeah. I think we're living in a judicial democracy today. The judiciary runs the state. 
the judiciary makes final decisions and sometimes it makes impractical uh, uh, judgments that uh, have serious implications yeah. for the state. And the mere fact that the state cannot be the final arbiter, not the state, but parliament cannot be the final arbiter on making policy that it can be changed in, uh, by, uh, by another uh, uh, arm of state is problematic for us. Because it means that the means to be able to access land for Africans and for land to return to Africans will further be disrupted and undermined. It also means that issues of mineral Minerals. We'll never own minerals in this country and taken by the state because they'll be ever for be undermined by the judicial side. Many people will run there for recourse. And, 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 and the fact that there's a group of people who are indigenous people of this country mm -hmm. who cannot take back their land and be able to provide the type of governance over themselves as they see fit. So the first point we are making is that we've got a legitimate right to enter this conversation and say to people who want to change this because in our times it's not yielding the type of democratic dividends. But, but I'm interested in how do we then do it because Correct. obviously you need um, you know two-thirds majority Absolutely. Uh, to, to, to change the constitution Correct. and it seems like no one is prepared to work with another person. Mm. Uh, if it's going to be Shiluba is going to change uh, you, you know that how do you plan on, 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 on doing that? Look, obviously, uh, we would need to, uh, after elections, have a conversation with parties who believe in what we believe. Yeah. And start uh, embarking on a path to be able to get this uh, two-thirds majority to be able to change and amend the constitution. By the way, which has been amended numerous times before. Yeah. So we must go now to the heart of the problem which prevents this uh, transformation for black people and prevents the serious rule of law and ensuring that the South Africans are protected against various uh, uh, things happening in our country and also this uh, foreign threat that we have. So it, it, need, it needs to follow an amendment of the constitution and changing it the, from the current constitution to the constitution that we will uh, find that is applicable. Uh, but equally, we are in South Africa, there's the, what we call the law of jurisdiction. Yeah. Whose laws are we using here? So I really think there was a disservice done because the laws that we are using were not infused with our laws. In fact, we are still treated as the captured and conquered. Because it's only captured and conquered people who you, the country that captured and conquered them imposes its laws and value system in, 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 in its administration. So we are free people. So we must insist as free people to actually have laws that represent who we are in our circumstance. I really think if we change the system, we're going to start to see better democratic dividends and improvement. But we have to amend the constitution. I mean, I've been looking at your campaigning. It has been centered around also, you know, traditional leadership, like traditional leaders. You've been engaging with, with them. Do you think, um, you know, they've some, somehow they've been left out? Uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in various decisions. Mm. I mean, you, you, you can simply see that uh, somehow, somehow, since, you know, traditional uh, or, or Africans, mm. if I might put it that way, yeah. they're the indigenous people yeah. of this country. And then you look at how their power has been stripped from mm. certain decisions. Yeah. Somehow, somehow, as Chiluva Party, I mean, you've been preaching the message that, look, mm -hmm. we need to go back there since, uh, you know, the issue of Ubuntu ideology mm -hmm. and make sure that power is given back yeah. to the people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what has been, uh, uh, what has it been like, you know, engaging yeah. with the traditional authorities and stuff? Yeah. Look, it's been quite a learning curve because we've also shared with our traditional uh, royalties and our uh, leaders of these uh, kingdoms that the, the, they face an existential crisis. Yeah. If their value, their perceived value, does not move from just culture, it moves into economy, it moves into governance, it moves into service delivery, then they will be cast into the realms of the unknown, uh, undervalued, and they will disappear. But they are also not innocent. They are complicit yeah. to the challenges we face today. And we've been raising this sharply to say, in as much as we see their value, we love and respect them, but when last did you hear a, a king speak against corruption, speak against yeah. unemployment for their yeah. people? When last did you mm. hear a king take a serious stance against his government? We are starting to think maybe we might not have these kings. And that's why we are seriously having the sharp conversation and saying, how about so maybe there's something that needs to be said. How can they be happy with just getting dividends from their subjects? So <laughs> it's something I really don't understand. So, so, so our democracy actually requires kings and, and queens who are able to rise to the task and the challenges we face today.
but their silence indicates to us that they are complicit, yeah. that they are happy with the vehicles they are getting from government, with the stipends they are getting from government, as opposed to saying, this is enough, our people are suffering. How can we continue to do this while our people are suffering? But you're quite right, they don't even have some of their power because when there's a service delivery issue in Malamulele, where do they go to? Do you think they go to their king there, in, even in Toyando? They go to the councillor. Even the king sometimes matches with them. Yeah. Then Duna say, hey, let's go to the council because they've got all the power. So we must restore this imbalance. We must restore this imbalance. But at the same time, our, our traditional, our, king, our kings and queens must also uh, be much more hands-on with things in relation to our culture over and above the economy and governance as well. We're going to park it there now. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we conclude the conversation. I just want to understand, uh, you know, your plans now. 30 yeah. days from now on, we know that uh, we are heading to the polls. It's going to be an interesting one indeed. Let's take a quick break. We're coming back after this.